the reason being and how it is kind of just a placeholder for now, but could be uh, modified over time. Do you want to go into that real quickly? And if Thomas has anything to say, we can jump back to him. Uh, sure, I'd love to go into that. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. This is a little bit freeform because uh, unfortunately some of the connectivity of some, but at any point we can jump back into those conversations. So we're just keeping fluid for now. Okay, without completing the salt sink, we can simply use our dredges, which can move material at well less than a dollar a cubic yard, even with union labor costs in California. We can build one around this size. Uh, now this would just simply be a, a kind of restricting barrier to start off with. It would be the basis of the perimeter wall for a salt sink. But we could put a little spillway up in here that would kind of restrict the water, meaning that the approximately 848, 50,000 um, acre feet per year coming out of the New and Alamo River will all flow into a much smaller zone which will displace the existing saltier, more polluted water. So as long as we do phytoremediation phyto back up into these areas, this whole area can have floating islands. Um, we'll talk about North Lake and um, this area in just a second. To give you an idea, the current sort of plan for a species um, conservation habitat acres and costing about $200 million. Um, we can do phytoremediation and um, essentially build a 33,000 acre sort of species um, conservation habitat for in the neighborhood of $40 million versus $200 million. And this would be, you know, this would include $10 million um, for phytoremediation um, and floating islands. Um, the cost of building this berm is actually quite inexpensive. Here's the catch. You don't want to let the entire interior lake go dry before you complete everything and import your seawater because these are not, these are designed, these berms are designed to be a separator of water. They can handle small differences in the altitude of water from this side to this side, but as this water drains away, um, the hydrostatic pressure on this side will tend to push water through the berm. Um, we can do the same sort of thing up here and, you know, again, these are going to be uh, increased channelizations. A lot of this is, can be drier habitat for selenium. Um, this can be done on both sides, uh, floating islands or permanent islands. These are berms. Okay, this would be a recreational ski area. You can have access right off the major road with a deepened channel. And all of these would be like canoeable. Um, these would all be wetlands and, and habitat. Um, but we can create zero dust emission from those areas submerged in water. Um, eventually, we will. Uh, let's see if I can find it. I wouldn't really. What's, what's the price difference on that North Lake here with a dirt berm separation barrier as opposed to a levee berm? I think it was like a $400 million project or something. Yes, uh, we're, we're talking pennies on the dollar for in either case. We could do both of these and I'd have to switch screens and, and check the task list budget that was included in our RFI. I don't have that number off the top of my head and I don't want to guess, but for <clears throat> well less than half of the $200 million to build this type of system. And as Roger mentioned earlier, um, if you build a berm, 
an actual levy, which is designed to hold water up, hold water back against the force of gravity, your cost of construction goes up by orders of magnitude. If you want a good idea for what this is that we're going to build, think of the barrier islands off the Gulf Coast. Okay, it's really just a separator, just sand. And we have unlimited amounts of silts and sands. In this area, you're looking at several thousand feet, if not meters, of wet silts and sands. If anyone who's familiar with the Bible at all has probably heard of Job and the wisdom of Job, the wise man built his house upon the rock. If this area in the upcoming earthquake uh, that's 130 years overdue on the San Andreas over here produces liquef uh, liquefaction as much as was exhibited on the 2010 um, earthquake. This is 2009. Watch what happens to much of this area as we shift to 2010. Okay, all this area here experienced li uh, liquefaction, differential subsidence. Some areas sank more than others. If you have that same, and you are very likely to get that type of subsidence in this area. If you try and build, I don't care if you build it out of titanium, you try and build a, a, a levee or dike and you get some sort of differential subsidence in this area, your levee is going to fail. If it experiences liquefaction, it's going to fail. And if you dry out everything down here, it's going to be like a, a catastrophe movie where the dam breaks. If we do, if we have water on both sides of the levees, and for some reason our mound kind of shakes and subsides a little bit, um, and you have water on both sides of it. There's a difference between earthquake hazard. Both of these have the same earthquake hazard. They may sort of fail in a 7.2 earthquake or what have you. The difference is uh, the earthquake risk, which deals with the money to either fix it or the damage caused by the earthquake. You try and repair this, it's hard. You try and repair this, it's easy. And the big difference is that Having water on both sides is actually part of the structural engineering and a reason why you build a sand berm rather than um, a levee to hold back water. Um, let's see. Let me go ahead and just kind of finish this out. Okay, if we finish out the berm around the perimeter, we cross the lake at the shallowest section. Now, yes, we can reduce this quite a bit. You know, we can pull this way back in closer. We can move the whole thing shallower, all of which make it less expensive. We have a lot of options there. One reason why you have Let's say in this instance, 90,000 acres. What if I told you that in grade school, we learned the solution to our planet's biggest threat? I'm talking about global warming. There we go. All right. I'm about done here. The re Take the uh, acres, multiply the size of the sink times six, which is the approximate evaporation rate for Laguna Salada. Um, 90,000 times six is 540,000. So if we import 500,000 acre feet of wa salt water into this area, we're still going to be pulling water around. And really, if we're gonna go that, I'd really prefer to do a little less import because the more salt water you import, the more salt. This salt sink would, at those type of numbers, would last about 200 years. Um, we'd eventually be able to salt mine, do salt gradient ponds, do lots of other stuff within this area. But we create 
for those who are familiar with the um, Bay Area Delta, San Francisco Bay Area Delta, basically this is our Delta. We're getting very low salinity water, increasing salinity, more salinity, and this would be like ocean water and would probably be closer to 45 parts per thousand by the time it enters into the salt sink. The salt sink will go to 350 parts per thousand prior to salt actually precipitating out of the water column. Um, Nathan, is that a, a, a concise explanation? Do we have more time? Okay. Um, one Go other, ahead. okay. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing, as we bring our water in, all right, number one, our pipeline is gonna be only about 72,000 yards long which is one of the smaller ones. Um, the elevation difference between here and here is um, only you know, 235 feet. Um, we may need a pump station here, but certainly a generation um, station down here. If all we're doing is importing water, you're looking at, I think, and Roger, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, about 30 megawatts versus power generation uh, that we would achieve there. We can do other methodologies, including maybe dumping water into the new, new river. The difficulty there is, is that, you know, flows in this river are currently 400,000 acre feet a year-ish. Well, if you dump 500,000 acre feet per year into of 40 part per thousand into four part per thousand, you're going to get a lot saltier flows, probably enough to kill what's existing there as far as vegetation to be replaced maybe, maybe by phytoremediation sort of uh, vegetation. But the, the steel pipeline is a convenient, easy way of not increasing salinity within the aquifer that exists. Um, not having to deal with crossings, entitlements, um, right of ways with lots of different infrastructure that's all the way down here. This is the shortest, quickest, easiest path. Um, and it will accomplish all of this will be living, breathing sea that is fully recreate, recreation encouraged and a zero energy salt sink. Basically, this is gonna, you know, this is designed, that one right there, to evaporate 540,000 acre feet per year. What water is gonna replace that? Well, if you put fish screens in here, water from this direction will replace it. So water coming in here is gonna be forced to flow around counterclockwise. It's a means of solving it. There are other ways, but here's one thing. Once you reduce the water to let's say 340, 350 parts per thousand, now you can put a brine pump in and move brine out. Pumping water uphill is expensive because water's heavy. If you concentrate the salt, you can move an awful lot more salt for the same amount of electricity up to different possible storage areas for it some 200 years from now. I'm very interested in working with our partners in, in, involved with desalinization, water treatment. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to get additional groundwater due to um, our um, connections with Andrea and um, bring black back the blue um, that we could mix and do a lot of, of agriculture up over here, which is part of the dust hazard issue. And one thing I just wanted to kind of close on, um, and I'd encourage all of you guys to get on Google Earth Um, because it has this time feature and 
I want you to look at, let's say the Central Valley all the way through, well, this is uh, Lake Mead, Lake Powell. And yesterday's conversations with the two PhDs on the monsoon enhancement was very fascinating. But one thing that you can do, and this is part of the conversation that they talked about, is we can go back to, let's say, 1984. And I know old Gabby will be quite familiar with this. For instance, part of Tulare Lake was actually flooded. Laguna Salada was flooded. The Baja Peninsula was flooded. Try, I'm going to do this a couple of times, but just try and think of yourself as the sunlight and understand that darker shades absorb more of you than lighter shades. Look at this region, 1984, today. You can look all around the Central Valley in here. You can look down in here. This salt deposit on the Baja Peninsula is highly reflective white. If we're looking to enhance um, temperature differentials between land surface and the marine boundary layer, then yeah, this whole area up in here, this desert, that's gonna stay desert. But you can look back and forth. You can see darker greens in many areas. You can, even watch what happens to Lake Mead here as we go to 2016 and Lake Powell. Their size and the reflectivity from the region increase dramatically as that lake shrinks in size. Um, evaporation's reduced. All this goes hand in hand. This is why we need those studies. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rob. I, I wanted to give you a chance to wrap up your conversation yesterday. I appreciate that. Uh, and, and this is an overall conversation. I mean, the, the section that we're bringing up here uh, was um, for the conversation about, you know, uh, tribal and indigenous lands. And what Rob just showed you on that screen, uh, you know, that is, this affects that whole region. So thank you so much, for, Rob, for that. Um,